interesting day. We've just finished quiz two, and um, during the quiz I handed a copy of the notes to you, along with the next homework assignment. By the way, uh, you've turned in homework number five. I'll mention that I'm going to get better about posting those solutions quickly, and in fact, uh, the solution to number five, which you just submitted, that's available now. I set it to release at four o'clock. So if just the suspense is killing you and you want to see what my results were for the uh, evaporation stuff in New Mexico, then you can look that up right now. And uh, I've also finished grading the previous assignment and your scores are loaded online. Um, a couple of people, I think because of the issue we had with the weather server, not emailing you the data quickly. A few people didn't submit the last problem on homework four. And in the comments, because I provide comments when I grade your work, in the comments I mentioned that um, if you'd like to submit that late, then I'd be willing to accept it. So just have a look at the comments just to uh, see if there's anything else that I mentioned for you. You're talking about homework five? Yeah. Um, remind me what the first problem was. I. Yeah. Right. So, okay, so you're talking about the book problems? Yeah. yeah. I think the point of those, having it be so similar, is just to reinforce your memory of uh, the process. And then you applied it with some new data when it came to part two. Okay. Well, today we're going to be talking about infiltration. And it's really important in hydrology because most of the precipitation that occurs ends up as infiltration rather than as runoff. Um, you know, by the way, since it's a topic right now, I guess I would really miss an opportunity if we didn't briefly talk about what's going on in California. Uh, now, you've already heard it because we discussed it yesterday in hydraulic engineering, but um, everybody's, I assume, heard about the Orville Dam, right? Yeah. Nothing? All right. Well, good. I'm glad we're going to do this. Um, in California, the Oroville Dam is one of the most important um, parts of that city's, uh, of the state's water infrastructure. And California is kind of a long state where most of the water that's available is in the north because that's where the Sierra Nevada mountains are. And so they go to great lengths to capture water in northern California and then send it to southern California. This dam is actually north of Sacramento and uh, the water here goes to what's called the Metropolitan Water District, which is a lot of different cities in and around the Los Angeles area. And so it travels hundreds of miles through pipelines so that people in Southern California can play golf, essentially. Um, this is the tallest dam in the United States. It's more than 700 feet tall. And uh, here's the main dam, just to give you an idea of the, uh, uh, the layout of things. Here's the main spillway, and then here is what they call the emergency spillway. Now through the dam, they have the ability to pass between 30 and 40,000 CFS through the power plant. It generates electricity, and in addition to that, there's another fish bypass that can do about 3,000 CFS. But when the water coming into the reservoir is higher than that, then they have to send water through this uh, through this overflow spillway. And so most of the time the spillway is dry, especially over the last several years when California has been having such a debilitating drought. It's been a long, long time since any water went through that spillway. And if we were to look at pictures of this reservoir last year, uh, the water levels were down to about 30% of the reservoir's capacity. Whereas now the reservoir is very near its maximum capacity and they're having to release as much water as they possibly can just because there's so much coming in. Also, because they've noticed some damage to the spillway. Um, a week ago yesterday, so it's actually been about eight days now, that they noticed that 
Now, normally, when water's flowing over the spillway, it looks like this. And these big concrete uh, pieces here to try and uh, reduce the energy of the water before it gets into the stream here, trying to mitigate the scour. You know, when water is falling 700 feet, it really picks up a lot of energy. So it's got a lot of velocity there that has to be dissipated. Um, but here's what happened to that spillway. A hole opened up. And this picture was taken on Tuesday. And this picture was taken, uh, I think, just a day later. And so this is how much damage had accumulated in one day of flow. They're sending about 100,000 CFS over that spillway. So it's a, it's a lot of water. Um, just for a little bit of perspective, here is pictures of guys climbing down into the hole on Tuesday. So that's before it was as big it is, as it is now. And I guess they're going to do inspection, but you know, frankly, I don't know what would be really the utility of an, an inspection at this point. I mean, it's just like, it's gone. You know, what are you going to see other than it's not there anymore, you know? Uh, but I, I guess they got to use the hard hats and they got to justify having those ropes. And so they went for the inspection. So here, on the right side, that's not usually water. That's usually just rock and hillside. And so the water should be going down the spillway without any interruption. Um, here again, we can see a picture of the emergency spillway. And by the way, I think that's kind of a bad name for it. People start to panic when they hear that you're using the emergency spillway. And normally, um, it wouldn't be an emergency to send water over the emergency spillway. But in this case, actually, uh, there were two simultaneous failures. So not only is there this gigantic hole in the primary spillway, but on Sunday, just this past weekend, when they started sending water over the emergency spillway because it was just raining so much and they had so much water coming into the reservoir, they, they couldn't get enough through the primary spillway, uh, they noticed that the emergency spillway started to fail as well. And so both spillways are failing at the same time. So it's a really bad situation, especially because there's a lot of precipitation predicted for uh, later this week. I think tomorrow and Friday, it's supposed to be raining in the watersheds upstream of this dam. So it's a challenging situation. Here's just another view that shows the gap that's opened and how it's just completely started to scour and erode this hillside. It's not usually a sheer cliff. I like this picture because you can clearly see that it's taking stuff with it. It's causing, it's causing erosion. You know, it's brown here because the soil that used to be under the spillway is being carried downstream. And this is more than just a problem for the people who live in the flood zone. Uh, this is an environmental problem as well. Uh, because the water that um, is in this river is a really important spawning ground for uh, the remaining salmon population in California. And in fact, the state has a really big fish hatchery where um, they had between, I, I think, around 8 million uh, fish eggs and uh, hatchlings that are threatened by the high turbidity of the water. And so they did an emergency relocation of about 3 million. The last I heard was that the other 5 million hatchlings that they had were probably not going to be able to survive the high turbidity because uh, you know, that suspended sediment interferes with their ability to uh, extract dissolved oxygen from the water. So here are some views of the dam in better times, back before things started falling apart. Uh, so here's the regular spillway, and you can see you know, the, the water really has a lot of velocity coming out of there, which is, you know, the stakes are high in a spillway. The concrete really needs to be um, manufactured to an extremely high standard for strength. It has to be installed so that it's very smooth, so that there's uh, less um, there, there's less possibility of scour. Um, fortunately, there's a lot of rock in the area. So uh, eventually, they'll scour away the soil, and there's bedrock. So it's not thought at the moment that the dam is threatened by the failure of the emergency spillway and the regular spillway.
Um, the reason why they started evacuating people is that this emergency spillway is between 20 and 30 feet tall. And so that if it, if this concrete uh, part is scoured away, because right at the toe of all that concrete is just the normal land surface. And so the water was coming over the emergency spillway and undercutting the foundation of it. So they started to notice uh, on Sunday afternoon, in fact, they sent out a tweet saying, we expect this emergency spillway to fail within the next one hour. And that's what prompted some of the most panicked eva evacuations is, it's not the 700 feet of the entire dam, but still, a 20 to 30 foot wall of water would be pretty bad news for the people that live downstream of this reservoir. This is showing um, when the water levels were much lower that there's a lot of rock that separates the two spillways and the dam. And so that's why you know, the language can get mixed up and people hear that there is a failure at the dam it's not a failure of the dam. I mean, it's at the dam. It's part of the dam structure in a way, but uh, they're really well separated. Here's a closer look at water going over the emergency spillway. And you can see that uh, once it goes over the emergency spillway, they really didn't put a lot of, I mean, I'm sure they realized it was going to flow downhill, right? But they didn't give it a very good place to flow downhill. Here's a road. So obviously they thought, if this is ever going to be used, that road's in bad shape. And then the water's just flowing over a hillside. And so it's causing a lot of scour of the material on that hillside and increasing the amount of suspended sediment that gets downstream. And so it's really uh, environmentally kind of a catastrophe for the uh, ecosystems that are um, on the receiving end of all this contaminated flow. Here's another view that shows uh, kind of where things stand. Someone went in and delineated the flow path of the uh, overflow spillway, the emergency spillway. And back when the dam was being relicensed, I think it was in 2005, it had to go through kind of a uh, reassessment process. And there were environmental groups at that time that raised the alarm and said, you know, this isn't cool. You can't just have the water from the emergency spillway going over a, a raw hillside that they were advocating that they should armor that hillside and clad it with concrete to prevent scour and to prevent the risk of the emergency spillway being compromised. But, you know, if you put in $100 million worth of concrete coating, someone's going to have to pay for that. And um, people in Southern California don't want their water rates to go up. And so there's always been this tension in Northern California versus Southern California that in Northern California, there's a lot of agriculture and the people there resented their water being shipped to the South for golf courses when they could use it for agriculture. Now the tensions are only gonna get worse because um, they could have prevented the failure of the emergency spillway by doing those improvements but the people in the south didn't want to pay for the improvements. And so now it's not just that the water is being stolen from them, but now their safety is being threatened because the people in the south didn't want to pay the price of the improvements. So it's really kind of an interesting intersection of risk analysis, hydrology, hydraulics, public safety, public policy. It's a fascinating case study. This is a uh, a side view of the area where they've uh, exaggerated the elevations to try and make it more clear that there really is a good separation between the dam and the failing primary spillway and the failing emergency spillway. So, you know, this big hillside is primarily rock and so they're hoping that will protect the 700 foot wall of water behind the dam. more views of the turbid water making its way into the stream and you can see here's the brown water with loads of turbidity and here's the water coming out of the primary spillway and the power plant that's a lot less contaminated. Lots of driving around uh, before they started sending the water over the spillway. I think that probably 
first responders and the maintenance people have been driving around because this, this damage to the primary spillway has been happening now for more than a week. But it's only since Sunday that they've been concerned about the emergency spillway as well. As well. So their solution, once this thing started to fail, they just increased how much water they were sending through the, uh, the primary spillway to try and draw the, the lake level down. And they've had the flow rates really, really high because they're trying to draw the lake levels down before it rains um, starting tomorrow. All right. We don't need to talk about pumps, but yeah. So why did the, the spillway fail, the main spillway, in the first place? That's a great question. I don't think anybody knows. Uh, there's really a lot of uncertainty about why this failed in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it could be a number of things. It, it could be that there was some local uh, expansion of the soils that weakened the concrete. Um, it could be that that patch of concrete was you know, this was built in 1968, and, it, it, and the con so the concrete's getting older. It could be that that, uh, that batch of concrete didn't have the same strength as everywhere else. You know, it could have been that somebody um, forged the, the strength tests, or there was an inadvertent, you know, like just a, they overlooked the materials, weren't as good as they ought to have been. Uh, it could be that there was seepage that carried away some of the material underneath it. But it's not all rock. You know, the hillside to the right of this is rock, but there's plenty of loose soil underneath. And so probably just some of the soil, when a little bit of the soil gets disturbed, then the water pressure behind it builds up and is able to move faster because the voids are larger. And so when the, when the water is moving faster, then it can carry away even larger grains of sand. And it's kind of a chain reaction once water starts to move through soil then it just keeps getting larger and larger, similar to those pictures we saw of the culvert failures, where water backs up behind a culvert. It can start seeping around the culvert instead of flowing through it. But I really, I'll be interested to find out when they finally identify what the issue was here, because I don't know. No, <laughs> ironically, no. <laughs> I'm glad you asked that. Um, this emergency spillway, I think they only put like 10,000 CFS over this emergency spillway, and it's supposed to handle 250,000 CFS. So they only put a tiny, tiny fraction over what this emergency spillway is supposed to be able to handle. But it's the first time it's ever been used. So, I mean, there was the design um, capacity of that spillway, but this was the first time they'd actually tested it. And I think what ended up happening was just um, the soil didn't have the cohesive strength that they counted on because if we zoom in on that emergency spillway a little better, what happened was that the material right at the bottom of that emergency spillway was carried downstream. And so as a hole opens, it gets bigger and bigger. And so it's not just in front of the spillway that the hole is expanding, but it's also under the spillway. And so, um, you know, I, I don't know why they didn't armor the, the bottom part at the bottom. Yeah. I mean, they, they knew enough about the velocity of water to, to put these in, right, these big blocks. That was to dissipate energy. I mean, they were thinking about energy dissipation with the main spillway. But I guess uh, they either weren't thinking about it or didn't want to spend for the emergency spillway because I mean, there's nothing here to dissipate the energy of the water once it goes over that emergency spillway. So, yeah. I'm just glad that I'm not stamped anything having to do with this. The people who did are probably long gone, you know. It was built in 68, so it was probably designed in the early 60s. Maybe they're still around. That's always the nightmare, that something you've designed and stamped is going to fall apart one day. I've got a project in Utah that I wonder about, that I designed a, uh, a really big drainage pipe underneath a road, 
and it was in such a flat area that we couldn't have very much cover for, uh, for between the, the pipe and the road, only about like six inches, and it's a 42-inch pipe. So I've got a 42-inch pipe somewhere with six inches of dirt and then a road on top of it. So I always wonder if that pipe has collapsed yet. I mean, th there was no way around it, but still, you don't like having those things hanging over you. All right, so we talked about uh, Oroville, California. Now let's talk about infiltration. And um, infiltration is really all about the movement of water through soil. Now I'm not a geotechnical engineer, I'm not a geologist, but we're going to do our best to just uh, look at some of the figures that are provided in the book and some of the, um, the trends and phenomena that affect the rate of water penetrating into the soil. And um, you may have already known about clay, that even though you can't see it when you have clay in your hand, what it actually is is a lot of very thin layers with a high surface area. And that's one of the things that's unique about clay, is it has a very high specific surface area. And so water penetrates through clay very slowly. Um, it has a low hydraulic conductivity, whereas water can penetrate through sand a lot more easily, um, partly because these voids are large, but also because the material grains themselves aren't as strongly attracted to the water. So in the case of clay, uh, these particles are very small, but also the water is very attracted to the particles because anything that has a small surface area is going to have a, a charge to it. And, uh, and so the, the charge of the clay particles is interacting with the charge of the water molecules to make it so that clay has a low hydraulic conductivity and sand and larger um, soils have a, a, an easier time conveying water. Um, so the point is that soil is a mixture of different components and this figure shows that there is a clay component, a silt component, and then a sand component. And so anything greater than two millimeters we classify as gravel, but these are the particle size distributions that define whether something is a clay, a silt, or a sand. And of these, the water passes more slowly through clay than compared to sand. And that's why we're interested in uh, characterizing what kind of a soil you have, is that you know, the classification of a soil um, describes uh, not only how quickly water moves through it, but also how much water is likely to be there in the first place. And this is an important figure because it shows some characteristics of different types of soil. Uh, and there are these names of soil, like loam versus a sandy loam. And what kind of a soil you have depends on a fraction, you know, the makeup of these three constituents. And so if you have, for example, 40% sand and, uh, let's see, if we had 40% sand and we combine it with 20% um, silt and 40% clay, then that would put us in the range of just on the edge of clay loam versus clay. So we'd combine the 40, the 40, and the 20. And so you look for the intersection of three lines together, and then it tells you where you are inside of that triangle. And so, for instance, a silt loam um, has a certain wilting point that's typical for it. And wilting point is important because it describes how easily plants can extract water from the soil. And what you'll notice is that um, there's a low wilting point for sand and a high wilting point for clays. And that just is meaning that the clay is greedy for the water. The clay is keeping the water and so there has to be a higher moisture content before plants can take that moisture away from the clay. But in the case of sand, sand isn't holding on to water quite as tightly, and so you don't need to have as much before the plants can start to extract it. And so there's a lower water content 
in the case of a fine sand. Uh, so a, a plant can survive when there's less water if it's a sand than compared to a clay. Um, the field capacity is talking about gravity draining of a soil. So if it's fully saturated and then you just let it drain for a certain amount of time, the range of typical field capacities varies. And again, that same trend is true where clay generally has a, a higher amount of water than compared to sand because the sands will drain uh, over the course of two to three days to, to a lower percentage of water. Um, now porosity is just talking about the fraction of the spaces inside of the soil that's a void. And I have a figure that kind of illustrates porosity a little bit better in a moment. Now I have to apologize. Take a look at the note I left to myself last time I gave this lecture. Some slides need to be reorganized. I tried to reorganize it, but there's no getting around the fact that today we're just jumping all over the place to a lot of different ideas. And I had trouble finding like a linear representation for like what to do in, in which order. So um, my advance apologies that we're going to be jumping all over, but it's all related to how water moves through soil. One of the factors that affects that is called the soil water pressure. And it's pressure in name only. What it really is is a tension or a suction effect that occurs. And in the unsaturated zone, I'm talking about in the part above the water table where there's some air in the soil uh, in addition to water. That means that's the unsaturated zone. I'll show you a diagram in that in a minute. But if you took fluid mechanics and remember uh, the capillary effect, that is, if you stick a glass tube down into water, then the water will rise up inside of the glass tube. And the smaller the diameter of the tube, the higher the water level will rise inside of this tube. And the reason for that is that there's an attractive force between water and glass. Do you know what glass is made out of? It's made out of essentially sand, silicon dioxide. And so, it's made out of heated soil, right? Heated, purified sand. And so there is this attraction between water and silicon dioxide that also exists in the soil. The water is attracted to the surface of the soil grains, and the smaller the hole, um, a capillary effect can occur. And in soils, if you have really small soil grains, what that means is that water is sucked up from the water table inside to the voids, and there is a, uh, in the unsaturated zone above the official water table, there's a higher percentage of water than there normally would be. And this is something that you can actually physically measure. Uh, there are instruments that you uh, fill water inside of a tube and allow the soil to draw the water out of that tube, and then you can measure the vacuum pressure, the meaning below atmospheric pressure, using a vacuum gauge in the headspace above the water. So the, the soil is, uh, is trying to suck the water out because of the attractive force between the water and the soil grains. And this figure in your book is just an illustration of the, uh, the surface tension as it relates to the fine-grained materials, so clay, versus the less fine-grained materials, like sandy loam. And um, if you have high saturation, then the pressure is low. Um, it's a driving force thing. If, if the soil is relatively dry, then the soil is going to be very greedy for water and there will be a high suction pressure because it's, it's tr really trying to draw the water out of that uh, testing apparatus with you know, a really high pressure. But as the water uh, infiltrates into the soil and as the soil is saturated, then there isn't as much of a driving force. And this figure helps to explain why we see a declining rate of infiltration during a storm. You know, during a storm, the amount of water that the ground wants to accept is decreasing and the rate of infiltration slows during a storm because of this effect. Because as the soil becomes uh, more saturated, 
there is reduced soil water pressure. Here's what I mean on the previous slide when I was saying the unsaturated zone. You've all heard of aquifers before. Sometimes in newspapers they talk about underwater lakes. And I always thought that was so confusing because I thought of it, what is it, like a cave? And there's literally a lake down there that you could swim around in? But that's not it at all. It's just think of underground there's soil, so sand or dirt or whatever. And that soil has openings between the grains. You know, think about a, a bunch of rocks together. There's empty spaces between the soil grains. And so inside of an aquifer, it's simply where all of the openings, all of the voids, are full of water. And above that aquifer is what we sometimes call the unsaturated zone. Another word for it is the zone of aeration. Um, Sometimes in environmental engineering, we call it the Vados zone because if you spill gasoline onto soil, then inside of this unsaturated area is where the gasoline could evaporate into the gases that circulate in the zone of aeration. Um, so one of the important figures that's showing here is we've got precipitation coming down and that'll either turn into infiltration or exfiltration is evaporation from the soil. Interflow is the movement of groundwater sideways. It may be moving towards like a, a stream that's not pictured here. Plants can extract moisture from the, uh, from the Vado zone or if the roots extend down into the aquifer then they can remove water from the saturated zone as well. And then here, capillary rise. The capillary rise is just the fact that some of those soil grains are really small. You know, there's a whole distribution of soil grain sizes. There's a bell curve of them. You know, some of the, some of the uh, soil grain openings are very big. You may have two big sand particles next to each other, and so the space between them is big. But you may have some particles that are very small and packed together tightly and so that there's uh, only very small um, void sizes. And so we've got a big distribution of void sizes and what that means is that you may have maybe like 20 small void sizes in a row and the water could seep up through that interconnected tube. It's essentially just like on this previous slide, the picture of a small glass tube if you have enough consecutive small diameter soil grain uh, voids, then it's someplace that the water can rise up where, uh, upward in, in the same way that we have the capillary effect. This is another way of looking at that soil suction diagram from earlier. And we already talked about the definition of field capacity, how that's how uh, you know, gravity, how much water is going to be in the soil just from gravity draining it. And wilting point is related to how well plants can extract water from the soil. And then the hydroscopic water is water that's really tightly bound to the grains because of the molecular attraction between the silicon dioxide and the H2O. And so now look at this figure. And what it's showing is pressure head. These, these measurements here are, it's the pressure head psi in terms of centimeters of water. And so, um, and it's negative because it's a suction pressure. And so there's a really high pressure. If you had soil that you put into an oven and you dried it by baking the soil, then you attached that baked dry soil to the instrument that allows water to be sucked into the soil, there would be a super high negative pressure there. It would really be sucking hard to get the water into that parched soil. Uh, less so as the amount of water increases. But what is called the unavailable water here, unavailable water is water that's not going to drain away. It's water that the plants can't use. And so there may be some moisture in the soil 
um, but the plants could still die because they're not able to extract that moisture off the surface of the soil grains. And it may be even that drainage isn't going to remove the, the water from the, uh, the material there. But the plant available water is anything above the wilting point. And then anything above the field capacity is the amount of water that will eventually drain and, and soak out of that water, like a, a sponge. You know, if you have a sponge that you soak, you submerge it into the bathtub and you lift the sponge out, water is going to be seeping from the sponge. And then if you squeeze the sponge, you can get more out of it. But even after you squeeze a sponge, it's still kind of wet. And that's what you can think of as this unavailable water. Okay, here's another great figure from the text that's illustrating water pressure in different zones. And so I like this cutaway because it shows the saturated zone, which is below the water table. But then above the water table is the, uh, the zone of aeration, or we call it, remember, the, the Vedo zone or the unsaturated zone. So there's this area where there's a lot more water than there normally would be because of the capillary effect. They're calling this here, it's called the capillary fringe. Um, and the water pressure there is lower than the water pressure uh, below the water table, and it's decreasing at the, the same rate. Mm -hmm. So uh, the tension saturated mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. The, the thickness of it, you mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly right, because the clay, part, the, the clay soils have smaller pores, and so the water will rise a lot higher, depending on the soil type. And so clay would be really high. Uh, if this was like a coarse gravel, then there may not be any capillary fringe at all. You're right. When it's raining, all bets are off. You can think of this diagram as a moisture content diagram. Now, it's, it's a pressure profile, but it's also a water content profile. Um, and we'll look at the water content during a rainfall event. So, infiltration causes the water table to rise, and then that excess water will move towards an area where the water table is lower. And so this groundwater movement um, contributes to, if this is a stream, it contributes to the water levels in the stream in addition to the runoff. It's usually a lot slower though. Like when we're calculating the peak flow rate in a river, um, the water, the time of concentration for surface flow is a lot faster than the contribution of a base flow. The water that's moving underground is maybe moving at most centimeters per second, um, probably millimeters per second at most. It's moving very, very slowly. And so it can take days and even weeks for the water movement through the soil to contribute to the water inside of a stream. And how quickly this infiltration occurs depends on what type of soil you've got at the surface, how dry it is before the event that occurs. It depends on what kind of plants that you've got and then the, uh, the properties of the soil, whether the soil was wet before the, uh, the rainfall event started. That's sometimes called the antecedent moisture condition, and it's given the abbreviation AMC, because how wet it was before a storm has a big effect on the amount of infiltration that's going to occur. And in California right now, one of the problems is, is it's been so rainy in the days and weeks before now that the storm that's going to hit tomorrow is uh, water on top of already saturated soil. So there's going to be a lot less infiltration than there was previously. And so that means a lot more runoff. You know what? Um, because of limited time, I'll just say a few things about this figure. I usually spend several minutes going over it, but we'll have to hit this one quickly. On the horizontal axis is time. Zero 
is when the storm begins. What this figure is showing is where the water is. You know, of, of the water that has occurred so far during the storm, where is it located? And at time zero, and in the few minutes before the, just after the storm starts, you'll notice the infiltration is big. A lot of the water is going into infiltration, but the infiltration is decreasing. And so the water has to go to other places. It starts filling up storage at the surface. So when you see surface storage, think puddles. Okay, so puddles are forming after infiltration occurs, you know, like when, when it's raining harder than the ground can absorb, then the puddles form. Now, soil moisture storage is a little bit later. You'll notice that, that that's to the right. It's happening after. Because soil moisture so storage means that some of the water that infiltrated is now down underground. And so the fraction of precipitation that's lower than the surface is increasing. Uh, after that, then groundwater flow is, uh, is that sideways movement of water. Um, at unsaturated flow is just the movement of water above the water table, so in the, in the zone of aeration. And then when all of those things are satisfied, meaning when you've got water underground and the puddles are full and there's still more precipitation, then that's when we start to see overland flow, which is what contributes in the short term to the peak at the outlet. And then the overland flow is then replaced by channelized flow. So it's kind of a conceptual diagram. There's no real uh, scaling here, but um, it's differentiating between where the water is going, and then it's also making the distinction between retention of water and detention. And this is kind of like one of those vocabulary, wor vocabulary words that you need to be able to distinguish between. Retain means that it's keeping it for a long time. Detain means it's just a, a short period. So if you get pulled over for speeding, the officer is just going to detain you for a few minutes. If you uh, are in bigger trouble, maybe you'll be retained for a longer period of time. Uh, so be able to distinguish between the two of those. Okay, so zone of saturation we've talked about, the zone of aeration. Um, in the zone of aeration, we can break that up into uh, three different subgroups. The capillary zone is closest to the zone of saturation. The soil water zone is closest to the plants, and intermediate is just in between those. And so here in this diagram, it's showing each of the different zones. So the aquifer, Below this water table, there's no empty voids. All of the voids are full of water. Above the water table, it's not that all of the voids are dry. In fact, close in the capillary zone, maybe most of the, most of the voids are, uh, are full. But there, there are some air voids in the capillary zone. But as we get higher and higher up, the moisture content is decreasing as we get further away from the capillary zone. All right, uh, let's pause here. It's five o'clock, about the halfway mark. Let's pause here, and then after five minutes, we'll get back together and continue talking about water movement under the soil. All right, so we've been talking about um, the capacity of water, uh, of soil to absorb water. And uh, one of the quick and easy ways to characterize that in the field is with an infiltrometer. And what an infiltrometer does is essentially it's a pan that you've cut the bottom out of and you pour a certain amount of water into that, uh, into that area. And then you can see here with the ruler they're just measuring how quickly the water level is falling. And uh, in a soil that has a high hydraulic conductivity, the water level is going to fall more quickly. Or a, a soil that is more dry, is, it's going to fall more quickly because the suction pressure will be higher compared to a soil with a low hydraulic conductivity or that's already saturated. So that's an infiltrometer. Now, a little bit more sophisticated is a double ring infiltrometer. 
And what the double ring infiltrometer accomplishes is it kind of um, isolates downward mo movement of water from the sideways movement of the water. In the case of this single ringed infiltrometer, you'll notice that some of the water is going down because it's moving sideways. But what we really want to isolate, in a storm, it's not only going to rain on a very small area. It's going to rain over a wide area. And so the single ring infiltrometer may overestimate the infiltration capacity of water because some of what's soaking down is moving sideways. In the case of the double ring, then the outer ring infiltrometer is accomplishing the sideways movement. And then this inner ring is only going to be having water going downward through the soil. And so the rate of water loss on the interior ring is closer to what you'd expect during an actual rainfall event. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah, it may be sand here and clay over there, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. And that's always a risk when it comes to field testing, that you'll be testing the conditions at one location and then that's not representative of somewhere else. You're exactly right. And so to be really cautious, you'd maybe want to take 20 samples over the area to, so that you can have a distribution and see whether everything is close together because it's the same or if there's big differences. Well, um, you can look, at, look to statistics to give you ideas of uh, how many samples you need. And um, so, for example, it, if we took 10 measurements and they were all about the same, then that would, have, that would give us confidence that we understand the picture. But if we took 10 measurements and there was a wide distribution, then that may tell us we need to take more measurements and space them closer together. So it all has to do with the deviation from the average the number of samples that should be taken. The main point here is that with the, the double ringed infiltrometer, it gives you a more accurate view because uh, this inner ring is just having downward infiltration. All right. About 75% of the time, I'll show this figure on an exam and ask students to explain it, whether it's a midterm exam or whether it's a final exam. And so you being able to tell the story of this picture, I feel, is very important. What it's illustrating is that, um, by the way, theta is moisture content. So it's illustrating that at the water table, the, um, the moisture content is maximum, meaning all of the openings between the soil grains are full of water. But as you go upward, away from the water table, and now you're in the zone of aeration, the moisture content is decreasing. And so the cause for that decrease is because we're in the capillary zone. And the further you get from the water table, um, you know, the water can only rise to a height that's dictated by the diameter of the successive voids. And so it's decreasing until we get to just this initial water content prior to any kind of rainfall and infiltration. Now what's interesting to look at is the profile of the moisture content during a storm. This is before a storm. So this is steady state right here. And it's the surface tension that's causing the, the high quantity of water above the water table. And suction head is a factor that draws the water upward. I really do need to reorganize these slides, don't I? Let me, before we look at this, let's talk about the storm. So this is what happens when it starts to rain. The initial is on the left, and on the right is during the, the precipitation event. These dashed lines are showing the water content this first one is just when the storm is beginning. So what it shows is that, imagine all of a sudden it starts raining and there's a puddle at the surface. 
that puddle hasn't infiltrated very deep yet initially. And so this dashed line on top is just when the precipitation has started. But then after a few minutes, this is now the water profile. It's saturated at the surface, and the voids are saturated down here underground, close to the water table. But in the middle, there's a section where uh, there are still voids that aren't full, you know, voids that have air in them. And so this is called a wetting front. And the wetting front is moving downward through the soil as the storm progresses. But the deeper the wetter, wetting front gets, the lower the suction pressure is. Because what was causing that suction pressure is just all of these voids that need to be filled. But uh, as the storm progresses and as the water fills up the voids, then that's going to decrease the rate of infiltration because it is um, reducing the driving force for infiltration in the first place, was that suction that's drawing the water down underground. So these lots of different little lines are showing the moisture front at a certain time period. During a storm, the infiltration rate decreases with time because of the reduction in the soil pressure. All right, so voids. We've been talking a lot about voids today, and I think this is a nice diagram that shows what soil is. Soil is a mixture of solid materials, air filled voids, and then the water that's around those so the solid particles. So right here, it's showing a case where there's a little bit of water. Maybe this is how much water would be remaining in contact with those soil grains after it was drained. You know, we haven't put this soil in the oven yet. It's not totally baked dry, but it's certainly not saturated because here there are some of the uh, spaces that are filled with air. And so porosity is just the volume of the voids to the overall volume. So if we had a certain cube, like a, a cubic meter, for example, underground, we could find out what fraction of that volume is the, uh, the voids relative to the overall volume. And for soil, it ranges between 25 to 40 percent, typically. We could also do a ratio of the water volume to the total volume, and then that's the soil moisture content. Um, when the water is completely filling all of the voids, then the water content equals the porosity. So theta is equal to the porosity when soil is saturated, meaning that there's no more voids in a situation like that. Now delta theta, this symbol here, delta theta, is how much additional water occurred, how, how much additional water is inside of the voids during a storm event. So it's the increase in moisture content. And then after it's drained, theta sub r is the residual moisture content. And so there's a, a term that comes up sometimes uh, of effective saturation. And here's the formula for calculating effective saturation. Now, I think probably everybody here remembers Darcy's Law. If you've taken a soils mechan soil mechanic class, you remember Darcy's Law is just a relationship between uh, water pressure at the head end and the downstream end of a column of soil and how much water can flow through it. This was a device that was developed in order to characterize the hydraulic conductivity of soil. And it's always easier for me to see what's going on here when I take that thing and I move it sideways. So uh, think of it this way. We'll come back to that slide in just a moment. But think, what if you had a pipe and you packed the pipe with soil? And then you have a tube that's connected to each side of the pipe. And so the, the tank on the left has water in it, and the tank in the right also has water, but the elevation of the tank on the left is higher. And so the water is going to migrate through that column of soil. And somehow seeing it sideways like that makes it easier to, to go on. I mean, it's, it's essentially the same thing. This is vertically oriented, but what it's showing is that the water is moving from an upper tank 
through the soil to a lower tank. And so there's a difference in elevation there. See, H1 and H2 is just measuring the water pressure upstream and downstream. L is the length of the soil. You can know the cross-sectional area and then calculate the flow rate as a function of K, the hydraulic conductivity. And so K is just a ratio of how much flow rate you get for a certain um, gradient of water pressure over a length that the water is flowing through. So delta H is the, the, uh, the difference in head upstream to downstream. And then L is the length of uh, the flow path that the water in the soil has to travel through from the elevated reservoir to the lower reservoir. Um, we can express that as a flux simply by eliminating the area term from the equation. But just to refresh your memory on how to use the Darcy example, let's consider this case. Uh, we have a K value here of 3 meters per day, and that's the units of hydraulic conductivity K, its length per time. So a fine sand is, as, is having a hydraulic conductivity of 3 meters per day, and so what flow rate Q will we get if the water's flowing through a, uh, a length L of one meter, the diameter of this circular column is 25 centimeters, and then the difference in head, so the H1 minus the H2, is 35 millimeters. So what I'd like you to try and calculate is Q in terms of liters per second. So find Q, find Q, in terms of liters per second for the case that's described here. Master. All right, so uh, got to calculate the cross-sectional area, put it into Darcy's law, and you can find out the flow capacity of that soil column. So that if we wanted to increase how much water can get through the soil, uh, we could either reduce the length that it has to flow through or increase the pressure differential between the upstream and the downstream or increase the cross-sectional area. Usually you don't have control over the uh, hydraulic conductivity of the soil. But that is just a reminder of one of the simplest ways to explain the movement of water uh, through soil is Darcy's Law. Now. We've already talked about how moisture content varies during a storm. Um, this is called a wetting front. It's kind of like a profile that shows how saturated the water could be in the voids versus uh, you know, what actually is the percentage of water versus the percentage of the voids. And during a storm, the saturation zone is above the zone of aeration. You know, before, the zone, b before the storm, we were calling the zone of saturation down below the aquifer. But now there's a new zone of saturation. Um, there's a method for describing that transition and, the, uh, and how much of the water is, uh, you know, how much of the voids are fully saturated. The Green-Amped method is a numerical process for calculating how quickly the water moves down through the soil. Like, rather than physically measuring it with the infiltrometer, sometimes we have to use equations to predict how quickly the water is going to absorb into some soil. And the, the parameters that we use are related to the soil type. Like, we'll look at the porosity, we'll look at the initial moisture content, the suction head of the soil. So these are all physical parameters of the soil, and then we'll use that along with this simplification to predict after a certain amount of time how much water has made it into the soil. But before I show you the equations and before we do a quick example, I just wanted to point out this picture because I think this picture does a nice job of illustrating the assumption behind the Green-Amped method. And the Green-Amped method takes this wetting front that's curved and just says, we assume that there's either 
the initial moisture content or fully saturated, but it instantly goes between the two. And in reality, that's not true. The water gradually increases the moisture content because, remember, think about the capillary effect. The capillary effect was drawing water upward from the aquifer, but now it's doing a similar thing. It's sucking the water downward from above. And so those really small diameter pores are drawing water quickly from above because they have the higher suction pressure. And so it, it, it's kind of like that capillary effect in reverse. And that's why in the transition zone, we have a gradual increase rather than what the green app simplification assumes is that all of the voids are the exact same size. And that's not true. There's always going to be a distribution in the void sizes. So with that visual representation of how it's simplifying the movement of water, here's what we do. We take Darcy's law and we apply it to calculate the infiltration rate over time. Uh, this just says the, uh, the driving force here isn't two pools of water like it was in the Darcy, uh, Darcy's law where we had those two tanks connected. Here it's saying our driving force is going to be how much water we've got at the surface. So H naught is the depth of the puddle at the surface. And then the second term is like the suction effect. It's the difference between psi, which is a measurement of the suction pressure of the soil, and then the length of the wetting front. And so this driving factor here is essentially, is the, if the wetting front is really long, then that means there's going to be less of a driving force because the soil is almost already saturated. But when L is small, then you've got a lot of suction that the, that the soil is, is pulling down the water from above uh, really high. And so then there's, there's two things that can drive infiltration. If you think about it, a big puddle is going to drive infiltration because the higher H naught is, the more of a driving force you have to increase infiltration rate. Or if L is small, then that's also going to, uh, you know, meaning at the beginning of the storm, then that's going to increase the infiltration rate as well. So this lowercase f we're going to use for infiltration rate, and capital F we're going to use to represent the cumulative infiltration amount. So if we integrate, infiltration rate over time, then that gives us the infiltration depth. So here's cumulative infiltration, the capital F. Cumulative infiltration says over time we can calculate the total amount of infiltration by integrating from the beginning of the storm up until some certain time the infiltration rate. And if we look at that graphically, We've already seen this declining rate of potential infiltration. So the shape of this line, the lowercase f, should be familiar to us by now. We've, in fact, we've seen it in lectures even before today. When we talked about hiatographs, for example, we had the declining rate of potential infiltration. But now uppercase f is kind of like a, a reflection of that. Because what we're starting off with is nothing has infiltrated at time zero, but then the rate of infiltration is slowing down and so that's why it's becoming flatter over time is we've taken the area under the curve for the lowercase f to find the capital F which is the cumulative infiltration. So over time the water is going downward through the soil. There's a wetting front there. Capital F eventually um, at, at any given time, you can know how much water has infiltrated by the difference between the initial water content and the porosity. Because um, the porosity is all of the voids, and the initial water content was how much water was there before the storm occurred. So uh, the porosity minus the initial water content was the capacity for it to absorb more water, and then capital F is going to be, um, the units of it will be units of length. 
And so just simply the length of the wetting front, the, you know, how deeply the water has penetrated. So the types of problems you have to solve on the homework will be asking, at a certain time, what has been the infiltration, the cumulative infiltration amount up to a certain point in time. And to do that, we'll use the green amped equation. So here is the green amped equation for cumulative infiltration. And look at some of the factors that are included in that. First of all, hydraulic conductivity is one of the factors. Another factor here, psi, is the, the representation of suction head. So it's, it's a physical property of the soil. And the handout I gave you for the homework gives you some typical parameters for different types of soil. You can see in that table that's on the, on the page there, uh, it's including, let's see, there it is. For a certain type of soil, the, the range of porosities, which is in the parentheses, and then the, the actual number that's given there is maybe like a midpoint or a typical value. So in the case of sand, the porosity that it's saying is 0.437. And then the effective porosity, you can see the, uh, the wetting front soil suction head and typical hydraulic conductivities. And so you can put those typical values in here and find out how much infiltration happens over time. The tricky thing with this equation is what we're trying to calculate is on both the left-hand side of the equation and the right-hand side of the equation. Do you remember what that's called? We've talked about it this semester in hydraulics. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's right, exactly. So this is an implicit equation where um, the unknown is on the left and the right-hand side of the equation, and so we have to guess. And we're going to look to, to substitute in guess values of f until both sides of the equation equal each other. So it's a little bit tricky here. And the reason why it's on both sides of the equation is the rate of infil the amount of infiltration that's happened depends on um, how much infiltration has happened up until a certain point. And so uh, this secondary term that's in the logarithm, um, it's because of this curve, in other words. How much infiltration you've had up to a certain point depends on what came before it. And so you're having to simultaneously uh, account for the declining rate. Now here's lowercase f. So capital F has units of length. Lowercase f is a rate. And it has units of length per time. So it just tells us at a certain instant, what is the infiltration rate right now at time t? Whereas this capital F sub t is how much infiltration has there been from the storm's beginning at time zero up until now, time t. Now, here's a calculation, a formula that we're going to need to uh, use for the change in water content. Um, there's an assumption in the green amped method, in addition to that wetting front going through the, uh, going through the soil column as just like a binary all or nothing increase, the other thing that the green amped method assumes is that as soon as the storm starts, there is ponding at the surface. And that's probably the worst assumption of all, is it assumes, let's go back to this picture. See this ponding here? It assumes that as soon as it starts to rain, there's ponding at the surface. Whereas in reality, um, there may not be ponding at the surface. You know, the, the rainfall intensity may be relatively low to begin with. And so the green amped method sometimes will over-exaggerate the rate of infiltration because there actually wasn't ponding right at the beginning of the storm. All right, so here's the approach we're going to follow. I'm going to do an, an illustration for you so that you can see how these calculations are done for your homework. We're going to use Excel because of it being an implicit equation. Um, you can program it into your calculator, but for me, I think it's just easiest to, to illustrate on Excel. So you'll be given some soil parameters. This is something that you can look up off of the table. Like in your homework, it says, uh, clay loam soil. And so you'll go here to find the clay loam soil and then just use the typical values for hydraulic conductivity, some time increment that you have to calculate it for, the psi and the change in water content. 
and then we'll guess a value of f sub t on the right hand side, find out what we get on the left hand side, and then we're going to use solver or goal seek to make sure that we've got convergence by keeping to change the guess value of f until the difference is equal to zero. Okay. Let's do that example. Um, if you've got your computer with you, you're welcome to turn it on and follow along. Um, you may not have all of the, you know, like the template ready to go. How many of you have computers with you today? Four? Have you got one? No? That's fine. You can just watch. And of course, it's, it's going to be captured on the video too. Um, you don't have to have all of the symbology, like with the Greek symbols and everything, subscripts. You, know, like you can follow along with the calculations without having all of that. Um, but in this example, what we're going to be doing is looking at a silty clay soil that has these characteristics. So this is the sort of thing that you could get from a, a lab test, or if you have a geotechnical engineer on staff, he'd tell you the characteristics of the soil, or maybe you get it from GIS data, like what kind of soil is in an area. So these are our s soil types, and then we want to find out if there's continuous ponding, meaning that if it's raining really hard, how much infiltration will there be after 0.1 hours and after 0.2 hours? So that's after 6 and 12 minutes. Okay, so um, first of all, I need to put in the effective porosity. All right. So from the description here, that effective porosity is 0.423. The suction head, 29.22 centimeters. Uh, the hydraulic conductivity, 0 0.05 centimeters per hour. Um, and then the effective saturation of 20%, I need to enter that as a fraction. So I'm just going to put in 0.2 for the effective saturation. And now I can use this formula to calculate the change in water content when it goes from the initial moisture level to fully saturated. Okay, so equals 1 minus S sub E times the effective porosity. So this is like a fraction that represents when the water was dry versus when the water was wet. How much of the soil volume is going to be filling up with water? All right. Now, um, we want to know what's happening at 0.1 hours. So here below all this uh, constant data, I'm going to put 0.1 hours as my uh, starting point. Now, the right-hand side of the equation, remember, it's going to be looking for some guess value of F from that formula. Um, so uh, let me minimize that so we can see more of the screen all at once. So here's the formulas. Um, so I'm just going to guess, I really don't have any idea, I'll say 0.1 as my first guess of the total infiltration depth during that first six minute increment. Okay, so now I'm going to put in the right hand side of this equation based on the guess depth. Okay, so the right hand side is going to be the K value times the time plus psi times delta theta times ln of 1 plus my guess value of f sub t, so that's b10 divided by psi times delta theta. Now I need to anchor those because I'm going to drag the formula down. And so I want to make sure that all of my references up here are anchored. So I'm going to press the F4 button to add the dollar signs in for the reference to the hydraulic conductivity, 
for the reference to the suction head, to the delta theta, but not to the time. I want time to be changing as I drag the formula down, so I'm not going to anchor any reference to A10. For all the rest of them, I do want to anchor. Okay, so if, if my uh, guess value is correct, then both sides of this would be the same. And so this column that says difference is just me subtracting one from the other. And my calculation convergence, I'm trying to make the difference equal to zero. Now there's a couple of different ways I could do that. Here under data, there's what if analysis goal seek. But you'll notice here I put this note that we should use solver and not goal seek. And that's because solver is a little bit more picky on the convergence criteria. Like goal seek will give up, like this is already pretty close to zero. And so goal seek may say, ah, close enough. We don't really have a lot of control over when goal seek quits its iteration. So I'm going to turn on the solver add-in, going in here to the options, add-ins, and then manage the add-ins and turn on solver. And so now that solver's turned on, when I go to the data tab, I don't just have the what if analysis goal seek, but I also have solver available, assuming that this all goes well. I'll pause the recording pending the successful outcome of installing that add-in. Okay, so if I go to the data tab, now solver's there. And my objective here with solver is I want, the objective is that this cell should be equal to zero, the value of zero, and then by changing our guess value of infiltration. And so when I tell it to solve, then it's going to find a solution, okay, it has a very small difference between the two. And uh, so it's 0.318 centimeters of infiltration that's occurred during 0.1 hours. And the thing to remember is that that's assuming two big contingencies. That's assuming continuous ponding at the surface. And it's also assuming that the water, the wetting front moves through the soil looking like that. Now neither of those may be true. And this one's definitely not true. The only way it could be true is if all of the soil grains had the same, if, if all of the voids had the same diameter, which they won't. Like if it was marbles, it would maybe be true. If water was flowing through like manufactured media. Um, but soil is uh, very heterogeneous. And so um, we can repeat the same thing with now 0.2 hours. We can do uh, some guess value. I don't know, after 0.2 hours, it's probably infiltrated more, right? So maybe my guess now will be 0.4 instead of 0.318. I can drag this formula down, and there's a difference between the two, so I'm not converged yet, but I can use solver to calculate what guess value of f gives me zero difference. And so then that will tell me it's the correct guess. So data, solver, and this time my objective is I want this difference to be equal to zero, and it will change this guess of infiltration depth. And so I'll tell it to solve. And by the way, I could go in here to the options, and I can tell it how accurate I want it to be. I could throw in a couple more zeros there. Let's see if we can break Excel with those extra zeros. It may take longer to converge. All right, so solve and it found 0.451 centimeters of infiltration. Now calculating the infiltration rate at a given instant is a lot less dramatic than all that. You know, we don't have to iterate. It's a direct calculation. It's not implicit. And so now lowercase f of t will simply be me applying the second equation here. So it's the uh, Hydraulic conductivity, I'm going to anchor that times psi anchored 
times delta theta anchored divided by the infiltration depth plus one. Okay, so I'll be able to drag that down for the next row as well. All right. Now, this makes sense. The amounts should make sense to us because uh, it makes sense that after 0.2 hours, you're going to have more, the, more depth of water than infiltrated than after 0.1 hours. We'd be in bad shape if it was a smaller number, but it's a bigger number. And in fact, it's, it's a bigger number, but it's clear that the rate of infiltration is decreasing. Like in the first six minutes, we had a lot of infiltration. It inf infiltrated 0.318 centimeters in the first six minutes. But in the next six minutes after that, the, the infiltration rate slowed down a lot. So it, it didn't double the infiltration depth. It, it's less than doubled. And that's because the, here, these are now showing the infiltration rate just at an instant of time. So at exactly 0.1 hours, the infiltration rate at that moment was 1.61 centimeters per hour. But then a little bit later, the infiltration rate dec decreased further. So that's kind of the uh, computational method that you'll need to apply for the green amped method on the homework. Now let's look at those physical parameters, different types of soil. Hydraulic conductivity. Sand has a high hydraulic conductivity. Clay has a low hydraulic conductivity. Remind me why. Pair it back what we've been talking about in terms of uh, hydraulic conductivity. Yes. Exactly right. So the, the clay and the water have an attraction, and so it's, it's going to migrate through the clay a lot slower. Why does it have that attraction? High surface area of the clay, yeah. It has a high specific surface area, meaning that uh, it's very small particles. So um, the way to think about that is that um, if you compare the area of a sphere to the volume of a sphere, um, if you have a really small particle, the volume decreased faster than the area did. And so you, you, ha you still have a lot of area, even though you have less volume. Did you have a question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, it is a big factor. And the reason why clay has a negative charge on its surface is because the particles are small. And so that's not unique to clay. Um, for example, in air pollution, particulate pollution, like uh, emissions from diesel motors or from industrial emissions, they also have a negative charge on them. And so like dust particles up in the atmosphere have a negative charge and then um, they repel each other. And so that's kind of why um, when there's condensation on dust particles, why they can finally collide into each other and raindrops begin to form, whereas prior to moisture collecting on the outside surface of a dust particle, those dust particles may bump into each other, but they won't stick because they have a repulsive force. And that same repulsive force comes into play in uh, water treatment because clay in water is stable. And so we have to, if, if you, you've taken water and wastewater treatment, right? You remember coagulation, flocculation? So that's a process that destabilizes the negative charge on small particles and allows them to come together. And so it's all interrelated. The, uh, the idea of small, small diameter particle and a high negative charge on the outside surface. All right. Great explanation. So what about this? Soil suction head increases from sand to clay. So the hydraulic conductivity goes down in this list, 
and then we see the wetting front soil suction head is small with the, with the sand and it's getting larger in the direction of clay. And so, I mean, that's kind of the same thing that we've just been talking about, but a different representation of it. The clay has a big attraction for water, and so it's going to have a high suction head. Sand has a smaller attraction for water, and so it will have a lower suction head. The water moves through the sand easily, because the sand isn't holding on to the water with the same pressure that the clay does. Effective porosity. Um, effective porosity is different from porosity. And you'll notice in each case it's lower. The effective porosity is never bigger than porosity. So, I have the question here, why is effective porosity closer to porosity for sand than it is for clay? So look at sand. Let's say 37, of, I'll learn my numbers, 43.7% versus 41.7. So only a small difference between the porosity and the effective porosity. But then down here on clay, it's a big difference, 47 versus 38. So do you have an explanation for why in sand it's pretty close together and clay it's further apart? The porosity versus the effective porosity? Yeah. Exactly. And so what do you understand effective porosity to mean? Like Right. That's right. So effective means like the water that isn't stuck. Clay has a lot of water that's just stuck because it's so tightly bound to the particles that it's not going anywhere. Let's go back to that picture of voids, this one. Mm. All right. In the case of sand, this layer of water around the particle is going to be very thin for sand. And so it's going to have a high effective porosity because all of these voids, water can flow through it pretty easily. But in the case of clay particles, because clay has such a high attraction for water, it's going to be a thick layer of tightly bound water. And so uh, the porosity, which is the void spaces, there's going to be a lot of voids there that isn't available for the movement of water in the case of clay. And so that's another thing that's contributing to the low hydraulic conductivity in clay is uh, not only are the, the holes smaller, the voids that the water can pass through are smaller, but also uh, what voids are there, there's a smaller fraction of them that's effective. And we can see that in the data table that we've just been looking at. All right, so any questions about the, uh, the various soil parameters that we put into the green amped method? S soil mechanics was my least favorite class as an undergrad. I, I mean, I hated it. It's the only class I got a B minus in. Um, but I like this stuff. This stuff's pretty interesting. I, I, I don't mind it. All right. Now, remember the assumption was um, the assumption was continuous ponding in the case of green ant, and that's a pretty sloppy assumption because you're not going to have instantaneous and continuous ponding in in every case. And so this figure is kind of interesting because what it shows is uh, our Typical curve that we've seen before, the declining rate of potential infiltration, but now what if the rainfall is lower than the infiltration rate? So if, if you're not providing an excess of water, then you're not going to have as much infiltration as is predicted. So this solid black line here is showing that initially you have 
a constant rate of infiltration because the rainfall rate is less than the infiltration rate. So the soil is absorbing all of the rainfall to begin with. But then those two rates come into equilibrium. The, just for just a moment, those two curves intersect each other and now the infiltration rate is equal to the rainfall rate. And then after that, the rainfall rate is greater than the infiltration rate. And so this inflection point is where we're now going to actually start to see ponding. And so we call that the time to ponding. If we want to calculate how long it takes until the rainfall rate equals the declining potential infiltration rate. So that's, we were looking at this in terms of lowercase f, where these were rates. We can also look at it in terms of capital F, which isn't a rate, but it's a depth, the amount. So the way that we turn a rate into an amount is just multiply it by time. So here, if we multiply the intensity of rainfall by the time to ponding, then that'll tell us how much water has fallen during this storm. Now again, we've got another uh, simplification because no storm is going to have a constant rainfall rate. You made IDF tables a couple of weeks ago, and you know that an IDF table has a decreasing rate of, of precipitation for the longer the storm. And so here, this is saying, well, what if there was a storm where the, rate, the rainfall rate was steady during the storm? So um, you know, in reality, the rainfall rate is also decreasing as the storm duration goes on. So these are, are simplifications we need to be aware of, but they're still useful because it allows us to calculate things that otherwise we just have to guess at. So here is the formula that we can use for calculating the time to ponding. In other words, how long it takes until we begin to see an excess of water at the surface. And it takes into account the hydraulic conductivity, the suction head, the change in water content, the, uh, the precipitation rate and the uh, hydraulic conductivity. And so just to get a feel for how this formula works and what sort of results you'd end up seeing, um, consider this example where we have an initial effective saturation of 45 percent. And so that's the S sub E um, from the formula that we've used before. Let's see, where was that? Here, this one. So in this example, we know it's 45% initial effective saturation, and that's going to allow us to calculate the delta theta. Um, now we're interested in a rainfall intensity of 1.5 centimeters per hour, how long until ponding occurs. And when you calculate that, it'll express it in terms of hours. So we know some parameters about the soil. You know, here's the soil description. I'd like you to try and use this formula to predict um, how long it'll take for ponding to occur. And then we'll go through part B and C together, because that's a little tricky. I mean, you, you can try and solve for I um, in part B, but I'll also demonstrate how to do it. But do try and solve part A, which is just solve for T sub P. So uh, if this is the rainfall intensity, 1.5 centimeters per hour, then it's going to begin to overwhelm the capacity of the soil to infiltrate it after about 9.4 minutes. And so before 9.4 minutes, it's going to be that situation where you've got more infiltration than precipitation then 9.4 minutes for that rainfall intensity is going to be where the crossover point occurs and then the field starts to back up with additional water. And that's when we'd start to have overland flow and, um, and runoff. Prior to that time, there wouldn't be runoff. And so in a way, you can use this information to help you uh, understand when you might have you know, 
like the, the time of concentration, to predict, to predict the time of concentration for a, an undeveloped area. Um, because you can use the soil characteristics to estimate when the ponding occurs, and you're not going to start to see surface flow until the ponding starts. Okay, now, on part B of this example, it says, uh, essentially, solve for the I that gives you a T sub P of 20 minutes. So this first part, we got 9.4 minutes. And uh, I don't know why it, no, oh, well, that's. So um, if we rearrange the equation to solve for I and put in a known K value for the hydraulic conductivity, the, no, the known suction head, delta theta, and then the time of ponding of 20 minutes would be 0.333 hours. Um, you can put that into your equation and solve the, uh, put that into your calculator and solve for I. There's two roots. One of them is a negative root. And so it means uh, it would take 1.036 centimeters per hour as the rainfall intensity for it to take 20 minutes. And so that is what we'd expect by looking at the shape of this curve. Like it should take longer time and lower infiltration rate would be related to each other. So instead of the nine minutes, we're saying 20 minutes. And so it would have to be a lower infiltration rate. I'm sorry, a lower rainfall rate for that to make sense. Yeah, I means intensity, not infiltration. The variables can get mixed up here. So the I is talking about the rainfall rate. So that's part B. Now, part C is another instance of it's probably best to use Excel to do the calculation. So how much cumulative infiltration during 0 to 0.156 hours? And let me show you how I did that. Um, so for the ponding time, we'll put in the, uh, the soil parameters that we know in this case, like the effective porosity of 0.423, uh, the suction head of 29.22 centimeters, the K value was 0 0.05 centimeters per hour. In this example, the effective was 0.45, and so from that, we can calculate the delta theta, 1 minus the effective times theta sub e. All right, so here's the delta theta. Um, now, we uh, will put in our time that we just calculated earlier in the example. Earlier in the example, we calculated for the 1.5 centimeters per hour, it was 0.156 hours. So for 0.156 hours, we want to find out what was the, uh, let's see, it's asking how much cumulative infiltration was there. So cumulative infiltration is capital F. It's this. We want to find out during that time, what did it predict for the cumulative infiltration? So we have to start with some guess, you know, 0.1. Uh, the right-hand side of the equation is going to be me keying this in. So K times T plus I times the delta theta times the logarithm of 1 plus our guess value divided by psi times delta theta. Okay, so just typing that in. I'm not going to bother anchoring any of those references because I'm not applying it anywhere below there. I'm just going to type it in this one time. Uh, and we have to do the same thing where we want the difference to be minimized. And so I'm going to use solver again to minimize this difference down to zero by changing the guess value of infiltration depth. All right, so it found an amount. Now, this is the green-amped approach. And what green-amped is saying is that it thinks 
that in point 156 hours that it's, it's, it's infiltrated 0 0.331 centimeters of, uh, of water. But there's a problem with that, is that actually uh, there hasn't been that much precipitation during that time. Like if we were actually to calculate how much precipitation there's been, we said that our uh, rainfall intensity in the problem description was Oh, it wasn't that example. It was this one. Rainfall intensity is 1.5 centimeters per hour. So 1.5 centimeters per hour, and it's only been this many hours. So it couldn't have actually infiltrated this amount because there hasn't been that much rain yet. And this is just highlighting the limitation of the green amped model, is it can only predict the infiltration depth if there has been continuous ponding. And so in our case, there wasn't continuous ponding because there was all of this time before the inflection point where there wasn't yet an excess of rainfall. And so um, when we're trying to find out how much infiltration there actually was, it's going to be the lesser of the F sub T that we calculate with a green amped approach or the rainfall depth times time. So to answer the question of the, uh, of the example, how much cumulative infiltration was there? It's not going to be what green amped would predict because there simply wasn't that much rainfall during the period. And so to answer the question, it's 0.234 centimeters of rainfall because that's the maximum amount of infiltration there could have been. That's how much precipitation there was during that period. All right, so you have definitely drank from the fire hose tonight. A lot of content coming at you. Now, this class is a graduate class, and we only meet once a week. So the best way, I mean, in graduate school especially, it's really sort of expected that you're going to be supplementing the lectures with readings from the textbook. And you're simply not going to learn all the things that you need to know by what I say and what you learn through the homework assignments. And you already know that because I gave you that list of vocabulary terms. And uh, I think we'll use a lot of those during the lectures, but then there are some of them that we may not cover or at least not in very good detail. And so I really hope that you'll make the most of the textbook. And um, it's not like we're covering any great ground during each lecture either. Like this whole lecture just comes from one section in the book, 7.4. So it's not like you're even expected to read whole chapters each week. Section 7.4 is only, I, I think, a couple of pages, but it's a good couple of pages. And so I'll encourage you to be good graduate students and uh, read the books, get your money's worth out of those. Any questions on the example or anything else before we finish for tonight? All right. Well, looking at the future, the next homework assignment is due a week from today. If you want to take a look at the solution for tonight's assignment, that's already available online. And I'll try and grade your uh, homework that you submitted as quickly as I can. And be sure and uh, you know, check the grade book to see your scores and also the comments that I'm providing. So. That's it for tonight. I will see you next week.